this is the second part of our series on time. We had a bit of a recording snafu this past Sunday, and the sermon video did not take. Therefore, I'm going to record it here again, so that if you are interested in keeping up with what we have going on here at Glory Baptist Church, that you can uh, view along and see what we covered. It will be a little bit different, because each time it's preached, it's unique. And then as well as when I preach in front of the congregation, and I'm standing and I'm walking, there's a bit of uh, creativity physically that goes into it. But I'll do my best to recreate today what you missed out on Sunday. So as I said, this is the second in our series on time. Last week we began with this unsettling truth that all of us have a limited amount of time. All of us have a limited number of days. So we looked at a verse that Moses wrote, uh, a verse in Psalms in fact, out of Psalm 90, Psalm 90 verse 12, and it says this. It says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And then last week we said, if we were to live in light of the fact that our days are numbered, we're going to make better decisions then. Because whenever you think you have more of something than you need of it, you tend to be a little bit wasteful with it. And we all do that. But to live as if we had really a limited number of days, that would indeed help us to be informed how to use our time, and it would help us then to make wiser decisions with our time. There are actually bookends in our lives. And that isn't a depressing thought. It's actually where we leverage the time that we've been given so that we have a sense of purpose, a sense of destiny. And so that was the big picture of what we talked about last weekend. Today we're going to be talking about something that I feel is very practical. Um, and I want to talk specifically about how to get the most out of our time. I know it's a, a simple principle, um, one that most of us, I'm sure, have heard before, we've heard elsewhere. I certainly know that I have. But it bears repeating. And I find it interesting that we find it in Scripture, both in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. And so I thought it would be kind of fun to illustrate this idea with a video. Again, we had some technical snafus on Sunday morning, but I will insert the video here of the rocks. So watch this video. There's a well-known story about a university professor who wanted to make a point about how we make the most of our time. The professor stood before his class with some items in front of him. When the class began, without speaking, he picked up a large, empty jar and proceeded to fill it with rocks about two inches in diameter. He then asked the students if the jar was full. They agreed that it was full. So the professor then picked up a box of pebbles and poured them into the jar. He shook the jar lightly and watched as the pebbles rolled into the open areas between the rocks. The professor then asked the students again if the jar was full. They chuckled and agreed that it was indeed full this time. The professor picked up a box of sand and poured it into the jar. The sand filled the remaining open areas of the jar. Now, said the professor, I want you to recognize that this jar signifies your life. The rocks are the truly important things, such as family, health, and relationships. If all else was lost and only the rocks remained, your life would still be meaningful. The pebbles are the other things that matter in your life, such as work or school. The sand signifies the remaining small stuff and material possessions. If you were to put sand into the jar first, there is no room for the rocks or the pebbles. The same can be applied to your lives. If you spend all your time and energy on the small stuff, you will never have room for the things that are truly important. Pay attention to the things in life that are critical to your happiness and well-being. Take time to look after your health, play with your children, go for a run, write a letter to your grandmother. There will always be time to go to work, clean the house or watch TV. Take care of the rocks first. The things that really matter set your priorities. The rest is just pebbles and sand. And the point that I want to make today as we continue to study a biblical view of time is that the key to getting more accomplished in life is not simply adding. The key to getting as much done in life as possible is for us to prioritize correctly. The principle that I want to leave you with today is simply this. Priority determines capacity. Priority determines capacity. Simple, yet deep. It's what you put first into that jar, so to speak, if you've just watched this video, 
that determines the capacity of your life and the capacity of your time. Now I realize again, this is probably not new information for any of us that are listening or watching. And so the question that I want to ask today, and I want to do a little bit of talking about today is, why don't we live this way? Why don't we prioritize correctly? Why don't we put those big rocks in first? And the reason for that is that, at least for some of us, we've just never sat down and asked the question, what are the big rocks in my life? What are the priorities? What needs to come first? What is really most important to me? What are my non-negotiables? And along with that question of what is most important comes the other question, who is most important? If you're married, your spouse is a big rock, right? And you're not supposed to elbow them when you're sitting in church going, yeah, you're a big rock. Some of us are bigger rocks than others. I'm probably a boulder. But we all have people who should be important in our lives. Our kids, they should be big rocks in our lives. Maybe some of your family members. Maybe some of your close friends. How about your church? The interesting thing is, and we've all unfortunately, if you've lived long enough, experienced this reality, the reality of busyness, uh, you find that when you're trying to force things in and cram things in and add, 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 you're always adding, but you're not prioritizing. And, and the result of that is ultimately the busyness, the rush, 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 that destroys our intimacy. Intimacy in our relationships. Not just sexually, but intimacy is often destroyed by busyness. Busyness and intimacy, they just don't coexist together well. So consequently, <coughs> we by nature economize in our relationships. And, and as we're adding, as we're adding, as we're adding, and as we economize on those relationships, those things that we know should be most important, but they don't get that focus, they don't get that attention, they aren't given the priority because we have not prioritized. But the truth is, chances are, there is room in your life for everything that you want to do. For everything that you want to cram into your day, into your week, into your life, there is probably room for most, if not all of it, if you learn to prioritize correctly. The problem is, of course, that we live in a culture that's all about the little rocks. We live in a culture that rarely pushes us or forces us to prioritize correctly. Consequently, we feel as if we are constantly swimming upstream. We feel like we're just working way too hard for so little progress. And we get to the end of a season of life and we find ourselves looking back and you think, wow, I, I, I could have, I wish I could go back and recapture some of that time. I could have accomplished so much more. And I suspect nearly all of us have had, have had a season of life where that's been true. It could be our, our high school years or right after we got out of college. Or maybe the first few years of our marriage, or maybe the first 15 years of marriage, right? All of us have a season where we can look back on it, where we wish we had done this better. Where we should have prioritized what we really believe are our priorities. And then put the other things in the gaps later. So what this whole discussion is about, and, and where it begins, is with the question... What really is most important to you? And who is most important to you? And then what would it look like in your day, your month, your week, your year, the rest of your life, if you were to prioritize correctly, if you were to put those things that matter most first? What would it look like for you if you did this? What would have to change? Some things you need to add? But you also may need to quit doing some things. What would you have to quit doing for this to occur? How would your calendar look different? Priority determines 
capacity. Now at this point in the discussion, as Christians, we need to remind ourselves that there is another component to all of this, and it's huge. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it tells us very, very specifically that we are to put God first. We are supposed to put the God rock into the jar first, before anything else. There is indeed a God rock, and it needs to be a priority. And the promise of the Old Testament and the New Testament is this, that if we prioritize God first, then that impacts all the other rocks that come after it. In a sense, the God rock becomes the organizing principle around which all the other things in our lives are ultimately organized. Now, when you open up your Bible and you look at this principle, you're not going to find the word priority or prioritize specifically, but you will find this principle. And the biblical equivalent of this is really uh, what I would say most closely associated with the word seek. Closely, priority and seek. And throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, believers are encouraged to seek God earnestly and to seek God first. And this was the authors in the Bible's way of saying, put God in that jar, put that God rock in the jar first. Let him be the ultimate priority. The first rock and the largest rock. Here's a couple examples out of scripture of that. Psalm 63.1 says this, You are my God, you God are my God, excuse me, and earnestly I see you. Again in Psalm 119.10 it says this, I will seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. See, you can only seek one thing with all of your heart at any given time. And by seeking God with all of your heart, by prioritizing God in your life, by making him first before all other things, it reorders the whole way in which I live my life. Because of your commands, God, inform my decision making. And then we see in the book of Proverbs, it says this. It says, Proverbs 28.5, Evildoers do not understand what is right, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. That's an interesting insight. See, he says that to understand what is right, to understand what is good, we must put God first. The prioritizing thing in our life as a Christian should be, God, I want to know your will for my life. God, I want to know it so that it will shape everything I do and every day that you give me. So that your priorities for me will shape everything else. That's to be our priority. And of all of the Seek God passages in the Bible, undoubtedly the most popular one and the most well-known one, it comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, we see when Jesus is talking, and we've heard this many, many times if you've been in church for any length of time, Jesus says it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this in, in Matthew 6, uh, verses 31 and 32. Jesus says this. He says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans, they run after, or the pagans, they seek after, all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. <coughs> now here's something for you to think about. Do you, you, do you really believe that your Heavenly Father knows what you really need? Not what you want, not what you think you need, but what you really need. Do you really believe that? All those things that we want to cram into our, into our day, all the stuff that we want to stuff into our weeks, into our months, into our year, all those things we are worried about fitting in. Do you really believe that your Heavenly Father knows exactly what you need? Because if you really believe that the God who is indeed God knows exactly what it is that you need, why in the world would you not put him into your life first? Jesus said that your Heavenly Father knows exactly what you need into that jar. 
and exactly how much of it you need. And he knows exactly how much you need it. And so then Jesus draws this logical conclusion. Jesus says this in Matthew 6.33. He says that if, if this is the case, then we need to seek first. <coughs> Excuse me. That is, when it comes to your day, when it comes to your week, when it comes to your time, seek first. Or prioritize first. Prioritize God's kingdom and His righteousness and all these other things will be given unto you as well. All of these things that we know that we need to fit in, all of these things that are important, they'll be given to you as well. If we would seek God first. So what this means when we look at this along with all the other verses is that as men and women who believe in God, those of us who are followers of Christ, when we've been called upon, what we've been called upon to do is to seek first and foremost the will of God for our lives to the best of our ability and then with that obey God's will for our life. When it comes to the minutes and hours of our days, our weeks, our months, our years, we've been called to seek first, to put in first, to prioritize everything around God's will for our lives. Your Heavenly Father has invited you to invite Him to be the organizing principle for your life. I think one of the best ways to demonstrate that in our lives, anyhow, is through daily morning devotions. What I have found in my Christian walk is that if I spend some time with God early in my day, that it impacts, that it affects, that it influences the rest of my whole day. Now for some people this means doing it even before your feet hit the floor. Waking up in the morning, spending some time with God, spending some time in God's Word, spending some time in prayer, and then maybe some devotional reading. And I realize that, for many people, life doesn't begin until coffee is on. And so, maybe as you're drinking, you know, that first cup of joe, you, you pull out your Bible and you have a quiet time. Or maybe, maybe you're one of those folks who has a long commute. Maybe you just buy the, the Bible on a CD, or you have it loaded on your phone, or you use version to read it to you, and it plays back scripture to you as you're driving or as you're listening. Maybe you do it in an iPod, maybe you do it in an iPad. Maybe you can use your computer at your desk at work. If you're like me, what I do is, when I first get to work each morning, I try to set aside a little bit of time. Where when I come in, I, I drop off my computer, but before I set up my computer, before I turn it on because I've got a laptop, <clears throat> before I get that out, before I check voicemail, before I do any of that, I stop intentionally, and I sit down, I've got a, a special chair in my office, and I sit there, and I have a quiet time, a devotional time, where I read some of the Word of God, where I'll read some devotional readings, and I'll spend some time in prayer. Now, yes, I am a pastor, so you might say, well, pastor, that's kind of sort of your job. And right, to a degree it is, but I'm still responsible for my own growth, my own spiritual walk as well. And so, what I do is I try to set that time aside each and every day. Because as I do that, it influences, it affects, it shades, it, it, it changes everything else I'm going to do for the rest of that day. Now for you, this might mean you have to leave for work ten minutes earlier so that you can make sure you have the time for it. Maybe doing it in your cubicle at work or at your locker, at school, or wherever it is you're in the morning, isn't the ideal setting. So maybe you do it on the bus ride to school. Maybe you do it sitting in the parking lot at work. Um, I would highly recommend trying this. Try this for a week. My challenge to you, in fact, is for the next week, carve out 10 minutes at the beginning of your day. Set it aside and say, these 10 minutes, all week, first thing in my day here, I'm going to make it a priority to spend some time with God. 
And then as you do that, and as you center yourself on God, it takes the focus off of yourself, it puts the focus on God, and you begin to see how God has orchestrated perhaps your day. And, and, and then as you get to that first meeting, or you get to that first class, you begin to look at it with new eyes, you begin to look at it differently, because now you've stopped, you've had that time with God, you've set that time aside, you've carved it out, you've spent that intimate time with God, and when you get to that next thing, that time with God can then influence and inform you as you move forward with that next event, or next project, or next class. And so, by doing this, it, it's, it's us recognizing that sometimes we give lip service to God, that He's central in our lives, right? But by doing this, we're actually making that a reality. We're saying, God, I want you in my life first. I want your influence in my life. I want to stand upon that as my foundation for my day. I want you to be over, on, and through, and in everything that I'm doing today. God, go with me wherever I go today. And when you say yes to God at the beginning of the day, it's so much easier then for us to not feel like we have to cram all those other things in necessarily. And it's also easier for us to say yes to the God moments in our day. Sometimes things come along and, and it's a chance for us to do something, a chance for us to love somebody, a chance for us to serve somebody. And, and in those moments, in those little God moments, if I've already spent some time with God that day, it'll help inform me, how do I move forward with this? What can I do in this situation? How do I handle it? It helps us prioritize our day. I love this quote from Martin Luther. And he said this. He said, pray and let God worry. Martin Luther said that on those days in which he had the very most to do, those were the days that, in fact, he got up extra early and spent some extra time in prayer. Not less time, but more time in prayer as he began to prepare for that busy day. He said the busier that he was in a day, the more time he would spend in prayer because he knew that by doing that, he would be doing whatever it was that he had to accomplish. He'd be doing it in God's will. When I begin my day with God, I worry less. That's a big thing. Worry is a huge problem in our world and in our culture and in us, even as Christians. So start your day with God. And so we find this in both the Old and the New Testament. We find that we've been invited to invite our Heavenly Father into our day first, into our lives first. And folks, if we, if we do that, if we honor God by placing Him first, if we make Him our priority, then everything else will begin to fall into place after that. Now, my goal isn't at the end of the day to have checked off a, a mark next to the box that I did everything in my to-do list. My goal is to live each and every day that God gives me in a way that would please Him. If I do that, if I put Him first, if I seek His will for my life, then I will know I've been successful, regardless of whatever else happens. But I know if I put Him first, if I put God into that jar first, whatever I do, whatever I accomplish, will be far greater and far more lasting in its impact than anything I might have ever done on my own. Priority determines capacity. So, what's most important to you? Who is most important to you? What are your priorities? Put God first this week. Set aside that time and do it for a week. And then continue doing it the next week. And then the next week. Until it becomes habit. Until we get accustomed to God informing our day. So that in everything we do, God goes with us. Do that and see how God can do amazing things in, with, and through you. Amen.